very special broadcast where we're looking at the American elections and the big question everybody is talking about is will it be Kamala Harris or Donald Trump who's ahead in the race to the White House? Will America get its first woman president or will there be a second term for uh, Donald Trump? As I join you from Washington, things have gone quite intense after the presidential debate in Philadelphia. This debate, uh, the first direct face off uh, between Vice President Harris and former U.S. President Donald Trump seemed to give an edge to Harris over Trump. It may have positively impacted the public perception of Harris, but will that translate into votes? There is no guarantee, people say. Well, Kamala Harris's lead has increased slightly from 2.5 percentage points on the day of the debate to 2.9 points. A week later, several national polls are suggesting that Harris has made small gains, but her polling average hasn't quite gone up that much. The popularity does not ensure victory for any candidate, say the experts. The deciding factor is the battleground states, and right now, polls are very tight in the seven battleground states. So anything is possible, but one thing is clear, that till Biden was in the race, Trump seemed to have a clear edge, but the exit of Biden and entry of Harris as a Democratic nominee has got the camps of both the candidates on their toes. And joining me this morning uh, is uh, Joel Rubin, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the Obama regime, also a uh, Democrat uh, strategist. You've advised uh, many presidential candidates in the past uh, how do you look at these elections, especially with the two attacks on former President Donald Trump's life? Uh, do you think there is a sympathy uh, wave or sympathy factor in these uh, elections that's crept in? Well, Navika, it's wonderful to be with you and with your viewers. And thank you for the framing of this entire discussion that we're having today. Uh, you're right on the money. The battleground states are what matters. And then the question is, to your point, how do people feel about Donald Trump? How do they feel about Kamala Harris? Now, the interesting thing is that for a long time during this election season, when President Biden was the candidate against Donald Trump, there was less focus on Donald Trump as the man and his record and much more on President Biden. He's the sitting president, and there were a lot of concerns about his age, about his mental faculties, about his policies. Now that Kamala Harris is the opponent of Donald Trump, people are looking at Trump. And to your point about uh, the debate, what they saw was scary. And so now the question is, can that image of Trump, the one that Americans tossed out in 2020, can that image uh, be restored enough to keep him out of the White House in these swing states? He's very popular in the upper Midwest, in Michigan, in Wisconsin, in Pennsylvania. He has strong base. But they're not the ones who will decide this election. The ones who will decide this election in those states are the independent voters, the swing voters. Roughly a third of the voters are t sort of soft, as we call it, uh, soft for Harris by seven points, for Trump by nine points. But then there's about 20 percent really undecided. I, I personally don't know why they're undecided. I think it's a pretty clear uh, decision, but they are. And so now... The challenge for the Harris campaign is to make sure that Americans remember who Donald Trump is and what he was like as president. And then, of course, to add in what she'll do when she takes the White House next January. Uh, do you think uh, these attempts on um, former president's uh, life uh, have brought the attention to uh, the vitriolic, confrontationist yeah. kind of uh, campaign that we've seen so far? And do you think uh, the American people... Uh, you know, would, would really like something like this? Would, it, would they like it to be toned down a bit? And uh, who's the offender here? Yeah, I'm really glad you brought it up. Uh, the, these two attempts on uh, President Trump's life are the one clear attempt and the one potential attempt are hor horrifying. Um, unacceptable political violence in America should have and does not have any place in our country. Uh, we have a history of political violence. India has a history of political violence. We know what can happen to a country when an assassination occurs, how it can tear us all apart. So there's no place for it. And I think that President Biden and the Vice President have made that very clear. In fact, uh, they spoke with Donald Trump after this second attempt 
attempt, well, as well as after the first. But after the second one, he said the call was very nice. He really appreciated the phone call. And I think that's what we have to do in this campaign. We need to have hard arguments about policy and really point out how the policies impact the people. And that's what this election is about. That's what the person in the White House will be responsible for, our future. Uh, but you're right to the question about these assassinations, significant sympathy for him amongst his base. But I don't think we're going to see sympathy in terms of voting choices at the ballot box uh, coming from uh, Democrats, certainly not, and even the independents. I think there's a recognition that the two people who uh, committed these attempts are uh, out of the mainstream. It was not politically motivated. It was for some strange personal desires. And uh, it's not uh, something that should determine how one decides uh, who runs the White House and ultimately our future. But does it show up a few chinks uh, uh, in the security yeah. apparatus? Yeah. And uh, isn't that something uh, that can be an uh, election point? It's a, a, an interesting topic right now. In fact, Congress is here in session. Uh, they have several more weeks before they close before the election, trying to get a funding bill. Uh, there's a discussion about uh, funding for the Secret Service. It turns out that uh, Republicans have consistently underfunded the Secret Service. Requests are now trying to do reforms and oversight. So there's a lot of political turmoil about that. Um, I, I do think that the Secret Service has failed in its mission at protecting the president cleanly and clearly, in particular in Butler, uh, outside of Pittsburgh, which is my hometown, uh, to see that attempt almost be so close to, to murdering uh, a human being uh, is frightening. And I think that the Secret Service has not yet been held to account to the standards it needs to be held up to to protect all of our political leaders. Uh, but again, I don't think that that's something that's going to motivate people at the moment when they're sitting there deciding Trump or Harris. That's going to be much more about their own personal goals and what they want to see the American government all about. You talk about Butler. So let me just ask you the question that uh, at that time, President Joe Biden had made a statement saying it's time to put Trump in a bull's eye. Uh, and, you know, some people called that out, saying that this was inciting violence. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you think do you think uh, positions have been calibrated since? Yeah, I think that President Biden apologized for that language. He usually doesn't make those kinds of mistakes. Uh, but we do have to also look at, quite frankly, the rhetoric that we're seeing from Donald Trump and J.D. Vance. Uh, just this past week, J.D. Vance being his vice presidential nominee, just this past week, he's been making false claims about Haitian immigrants living in Ohio, claiming that they're eating pets and cats and dogs, not verified. In fact, re these are uh, ideas rejected by the mayor of that town, and the mayor is a Republican and rejected by the governor of the state of Ohio, who is also a Republican, saying this is not good. What was the result of their reckless comments? 30 bomb threats at schools in Springfield, Ohio. They had to evacuate schools. Uh, and, and they have not apologized for their loose rhetoric. So their, their violent rhetoric continues. And I think that's the sad thing for me as an American uh, to see J.D. Vance immediately after the first assassination attempt blame Democrats within minutes on Twitter, said it was Democrats' fault. It turns out that the shooter is a registered Republican. That's immaterial. It's not a political party that sent an assassin. So that kind of rhetoric needs to stop. And unfortunately, I think that Donald Trump, uh, he did it again last night. He used inflammatory rhetoric against American Jews, saying that you'll be to blame if I lose, which is classic anti-Semitism. So I think that Trump and Vance really need to sort of take their own medicine when they complain about Joe Biden, for example, saying one thing here or there, uh, they're really at fault for raising the violent rhetoric in this country in this campaign season. So let me let me ask you, social media platforms, have they have they become an instrument for uh, uh, polarizing rhetoric? We've seen that mm -hmm. back home in the Indian elections. Yeah. And social media platforms are also uh, seen to uh, you know, put the trends one way or the other, at least in terms of support or being against a particular candidate uh, through the algorithms, uh, etc. Yes. So uh, do you think do you think that's happening now across the world? And we're seeing uh, somewhat uh, these platforms, uh, uh, you know, doing it in the American elections as well. There's a, a couple of, of uh, levels of, of, of analysis about social media platforms and their influence on campaigns, I think, are very important. There are, of course, the good actors, the partisans, the activists, the people who want to 
communicate a message about support Harris, support Trump, support abortion rights, oppose uh, raising taxes. Those good actors, they push their message on social media. They try to amplify it and get people excited and thinking different ways to influence their votes. That's legitimate political participation. There are, however, other uh, actors out there, and there's a significant amount of disinformation, in particular coming from Russia. We saw this in 2016. We're seeing it again now, uh, coming from Iran, meddling in our elections, actually using bots and other types of amplifiers to try to sway Americans to take certain positions that our own uh, intelligence community and Justice Department have identified and are in, uh, leveling indictments against. That's very dangerous. And then the third, and I have to mention this, what happens when one of the platforms, a website like X, is owned by one guy who decides he has a particular person he supports? Um, that's a strange occurrence in our politics. Typically, the media stays out, stays unbiased. Historically, in the United States, the media does not endorse a specific a candidate in an overt way. Maybe at the end, uh, the, uh, the newspaper will say, I support or we support this candidate. But right now, we have now what will be months of ongoing public endorsement of Donald Trump by Elon Musk, and there's a lot, uh, and X, and Twitter. There's a lot of concern that he is suppressing pro Harris sentiment on this website, which has hundreds of millions of people on it, and that he's promoting Donald Trump. And that really skewers the perception. So there's a lot happening in social media, but we have to accept the fact that it is the way people communicate right now. Uh, it is the critical component to getting out message. It amplifies ideas. It integrates television. And, and this interview will be played on social media and amplified. Uh, and, and yet we have to understand that there's more at play than just the good actors like the first group I was talking about. So you just don't have uh, the Russians to blame for elections. You even have uh, Elon Musk uh, yes. uh, right home in the mix. We have uh, a, a strange dynamic now in social media where it is so open to the world and where these platforms are owned by multi-billionaires that, yes, this is what's happening now. It is a... Uh, a, a, an attempt to sway how Americans think and view. Uh, let me take a step back and, and explain just briefly. In American politics, there are limits to how much one can finance a candidate or a campaign. There are limits because it's try we've tried to have a level playing field. We have not yet addressed this problem in social media where there's a billionaire putting unlimited assets and resources into supporting a candidate so overtly. So this is new territory. All that said, it's not as if Democrats are without uh, capacity to counter it. And there's significant activity online by Democratic activists and organizations to push back Taylor and Swift. promote their ideas. Taylor Swift, <laughs> exactly. She doesn't own the platform, though. So the question will be, will Elon Musk suppress her amplification or not? Uh, but if he does, he will be called out for it, and hopefully it will balance. But I do think on the foreign actor issue, as a former State Department official, I put on my national security hat, and that is a danger to the United States. Uh, uh, as an American, we don't want foreign countries, our actors, adversaries to help uh, or to, to thwart our ideas and to shape how we decide who our leaders should be. Nobody should. I would say the same for overseas. The United States engaging in trying to tell who a leader is of another country is not a good policy. Uh, but that is what's happening, and it certainly is what happened in 2016, and it's certainly uh, there are attempts, again, because of the openness of social media and the ability of people around the world to get directly into the brains of American voters. It's such an attractive tool for foreign adversaries, and so the United States government has to be mindful of it, as do the voters. So let me ask you, as far as policies go, uh President Biden has presided over a pandemic, uh, the post-pandemic uh, collapse of economies across the world, and then the recovery. Uh, uh, but inflation, while now in control, has been an issue in the American economy. Growth has been an issue. How much uh, do you think are these factors going to influence the decision of Americans in these elections? Uh, or, or is it the sound and fury of, of the rhetoric uh, that's going to overtake everything? Well, I'd love to say it's the sound and fury because isn't that more interesting and fun to look at and talk about? But in poll 
poll after poll after poll after poll, the economy is the number one issue by far. Uh, and amongst independent uh, voters in the swing states, the economy uh, registers as 71 percent in terms of what they're most interested in. It's off the charts. And that means two things. A, what's happening in the big economy? What are the indicators? The stock market, for example, yesterday hit the highest level it's ever hit. Inflation is down at lower levels than we've had since the end of the Trump term. And the Federal Reserve cut interest rates by half a point, likely to cut more, so inflation will continue to go down. We're the envy of the world on our inflation numbers. No other economy in, uh, in uh, uh, the, the, the G7, no other economy in Western economies has even come close to our economic recovery post-pandemic. All that said, how do Americans feel in their pocketbook? And this is where Kamala Harris is trying to uh, change her messaging a bit from President Biden. President Biden spoke heavily about investment in industry, the Midwest, growing the factory towns, rebuilding our broken communities in the heartland of the country. While the vice president, of course, supports that, she's trying to talk more about what we call the care economy, talking about getting more money in the pocketbook of regular Americans, uh, reducing the cost of child care, uh, helping uh, new businesses get uh, bigger grants and first time homeowners getting $25,000 uh, grants, for example, reducing the cost of college and debt forgiveness, all those sort of uh, tangible economic benefits. And I think that's where we're going to see her and Trump ultimately fight it out. And that's where Americans are going to ultimately vote. Do I trust this person to manage the economy versus that one? And I would say as a Democrat, uh, Donald Trump presided over flat uh, job growth. No matter what people want to say about the pandemic, job growth was relatively flat prior to the pandemic. Uh, he increased our national debt by $8 trillion. Much of that accrued prior to the pandemic. He has a tax cut proposal that will reward Elon Musk and penalize the rest of us, raise all of our taxes. And he wants to raise our taxes by implementing tariffs that would directly affect the pocketbook of regular American people. So those are the arguments that will carry the day. In touch with Kamala Harris, and if, if you were to advise her, what would you say uh, the rest of her uh, campaign should be all about? And do, do you expect to see another uh, presidential debate? Because Donald Trump uh, has hinted that he's not quite interested. But what's your bet on? Will well, there be one? You know, in my engagements with the campaign, I think what we see and what we hear is a campaign that's fired up, a campaign that's confident in their candidate, a campaign that has broken all plausible records of fundraising. Uh, Kamala Harris raised $530 million between the moment she jumped into the end of August over like a five-week period. Record fundraising, never before seen. So there's deep enthusiasm and support from the base of the Democratic Party. I do think you're right. I think Donald Trump is afraid of debating her. I think he, once was enough for him, he got out of there. In fact, he did something at the end of that debate that uh, shows how much he knows he, he lost the debate. Is He went into what's called the spin room. Uh, behind the scenes, after a debate, uh, basically surrogates, meaning allies of the, the candidates, go and talk to the media and try to convince them that their candidate won. The candidates are done, but he went in. And he tried to convince the media, I really won, I really won. Well, uh, he knows he lost. He, he lost by 20, 30 points in most polls. And it has had a material impact on his campaign and on their enthusiasm. Vice, uh, the Harris campaign and the people in the campaign are very excited about her as a candidate. I think they'd love to have another debate. I think Donald Trump is deeply afraid of that. We will have one vice presidential debate uh, at the beginning on the next first month. Of October. Tim Waltz and J.D. Vance, that's going to be a fun one to watch because uh, these two gentlemen uh, both are strong Midwestern guys who want to kind of fight it out and argue it out, and I think it's going to be a really entertaining debate. But ultimately, Americans are going to vote based upon Harris versus Trump, not Waltz versus Vance. And how do you look at... Uh India and America's relationship uh, as uh, a fallout after elections, depending on which side wins? Yeah, I think, well, look, at what President Biden, uh, under him, we've seen a resurgence and a renewal of, of the relationship at a level that uh, is quite exciting and unprecedented. I uh, attended uh, a, a welcoming ceremony uh, uh, when, when, the president, when, when President Modi came to Washington several months ago. Uh, there's a real uh, uh, awareness of the value of the U.S.-India relationship, a partnership and alliance. And of course, we have a very exciting a diaspora community of Indian Americans that are very 
uh, engaged politically and socially, culturally. It's a real renewal and, and an exciting moment for American Indian relations. I, I tend to think that there won't be much difference in the policy, but I would say that for Donald Trump, uh, people have to remember that on foreign policy, he's chaotic. On foreign policy, he's unpredictable. On foreign policy, you never know which way he's going to wake up one day and send out a social media post attacking a leader who two days before thought was his best friend. That's Donald Trump. There's no certainty, and it's not a reliable partner. Uh, and Kamala Harris, you're going to see very similar to, vice, uh, to President Biden when she was vice president. She was his loyal lieutenant. She would go out and advocate on his behalf with his language, and they were in sync, and they were stable and predictable. We can debate about certain aspects of the relations, but I think in international affairs, stability from the United States and predictability and clarity is incredibly important for countries around the world. They want to know where the United States is. That's what we'll get in Kamala Harris. They will not get that with Donald Trump. But Kamala Harris's position on Kashmir, Article 370, which are close uh, uh, to the hearts of yes. uh, the government in power, do you yes. think that's going to uh, have an impact? Well, I have to tell you, I'm not sure that she's exactly going to lay out all her policies right now on foreign policy and national security. In fact, I think they're going to, like all president presidential campaigns, if and when she wins, there's a transition period, an assessment, then a new team comes in. I think that these are all the kinds of policies so that what you'll get with the Kamala Harris as a president is someone who will listen, someone who will uh, go back, study the issue, and make sure that the policy is advanced and that you'll know what that policy is. With Donald Trump, again, um, we've seen it uh, with North Korea, for example, with Kim, where I, one day he wants to drop a nuclear bomb on Pyongyang. The next day he's in love with him. It makes no sense. It's not the way to run a, a government, certainly not a way to represent the United States around the world. Well, uh, uh, looking at uh, the entire gamut of uh, issues, uh, as they say, in this race, uh, may the best man, or rather, in this case, the best Absolutely. woman, uh, win the elections. But uh, robust, what we have in common between India and the United States is the democratic values and every election that is the people's choice. Uh, and all the very best, uh, Joel Rubin, for joining me. And uh, speaking about elections that are also close to all our hearts, the oldest democracy and the largest one. My Thank pleasure. You. Thank you. It was an Thank honor. You very much.